my name is Asher Price. I'm a reporter at the Austin American Statesman, a longtime uh, writer about energy and environmental issues here in Texas. And um, uh, last year, I had the pleasure of being a fellow at the Energy Institute at the, at the University of Texas. And um, one of the really wonderful things about the Energy Institute was the people who populated it, including uh, Dr. Kerry King. Um, and um, as many of you may know, um, Kerry performs a range of um, interdisciplinary research on how energy systems interact within the economy and the environment, as well as how our policy and social systems can make decisions and trade-offs among often competing factors. Um, these are real issues and important questions that, um, that policymakers are grappling with. And um, one of the things that, I, that really struck me about Kerry, who is a longhorn through and through, he, he did his undergraduate and doctoral work at, at UT, um, is that he's somebody who cares about, um, about communicating with the public and engaging in, in issues that, 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 that matter to people. I mean, where we get our electricity from, how much it costs, um, these, are, these are important questions. Um, and, um, and, and he also was very thoughtful about my own work uh, while I was working at the Energy Institute and I really appreciated his feedback. Um, so I think the, the, the way he approaches his work really speaks to some of the issues that things we're gonna talk about today. That is, um, uh, this, this new um, sort of energy dashboard that we'll talk about, as well as um, if we get have some time to talk about it, Carrie's new book, which is really an amazing um, feat, and uh, uh, which is called The Economic Superorganism. Um, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later about kind of competing narratives of, uh, about energy and the environment. But for now, uh, let's talk about uh, about this, this thing we've all convened to talk about, uh, that we've convened to hear Kerry talk about, which is this project he's been working on for quite a while about uh, this dashboard about, uh, about our energy future, really. Um, and so, Kerry, I wondered if, if you could, could just start by telling us what you call this dashboard, um, who is this dashboard for, what's the intended audience, and then also, um, kind of what prompted it. And I, by the way, I call it a dashboard, but I guess you could call it a toolkit as well. So um, I wonder if you could just give us a broad, that kind of broad overview of it to begin with. All right, thanks, Asher. Your introduction is more than kind and I appreciated sharing thoughts with you while you were in our office. I'll just state that this tool is really not a product per se of the Energy Institute, you know, people only. It's really a product of the university overall and several people were involved in this and we'll see it see them listed in the documentation on our website, which I'll, I'll look at here in a second. Um, but in terms of the goals of this, we call this the Energy Futures Dashboard. It allows users to select some subset of options for the, to set the future energy goals for themselves in the year 2050. But really the goal of this and some of the other tools we've facilitated at the Energy Institute is to be a convener for discussions, really. That's probably one of the main topics. So facilitate discussions amongst the energy industry uh, itself, some uh, different people within the electricity or oil and gas sector are certainly experts at more than one topic, but not necessarily everything. This incorporates some different uh, topics put together uh, from transportation through electricity. Um, we hope to engage policymakers and non-governmental organizations that think about energy and the environment. Um, and it can be used by academics as well. Many times academics and certainly consultants in the industry have more complicated tools than what this dashboard is, this online tool. And so it, it, it can help them understand some things, but many people know uh, the issues in more detail, but this can still be used to facilitate research for those that are not involved in as much detailed studies and general education of students and the public broadly. So we just hope to provide a, a tool that can engage questions, um, uh, engage different audiences. Um, it's the goal was to make an online tool. Some of this was derived from our previous work that we called the full cost of electricity that engaged over a dozen faculty on campus. And one of the outcomes of that was an online tool to calculate levelized cost of electricity. And because it has colors and buttons, 
uh, that seemed to attract a lot of attention. So we thought, well, let's try to make another tool that's one step more complicated and it has colors and buttons. So that's what we have. Um, and when you make something online and you want people to engage, it can't necessarily do the same things that an academic tool or a consultant level tool might do, which is maybe run for hours because you're just going to produce one report a year or something like this. It's got to run in less than a minute or minutes. So this facilitated trade-offs. Um, there are simple assumptions that we make. I'll just highlight where I am here, uh, such as how to store electricity from wind and solar. I'll discuss that in detail in a second. Um, there's no demand response. Once you sort of user chooses some inputs, the electricity demand is fixed every hour of the year. Um, doesn't change. That's that's not how the world, real world will react. And there's nothing specific about exactly where power plants are. We sort of say generally they're in these regions of the United States, but where you put power plants uh, matters and there's lack of detail there. Uh, but with that said, we do have good time resolution and some realistic aspects that are important that I'll demonstrate. Um, in a second. Um, we have hourly resolution for electricity load and demand and patterns. And so these are calibrated to the year 2016 in terms of a weather year so that they all match with weather patterns and load. Uh, but we scale these up to 2050. Uh, and we have 13 different regions of the country that a user can select to play with the tool. Um, and that's to facilitate different renewable resource regions and uh, certainly different weather, climate, and load uh, patterns that exist across the country. So that's kind of the highlights of what we're doing and what our general goals were. Great, thanks Thanks for that. Um, and by the way, I should say to the participants, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to um, to throw them in the Q&A you know, chat uh, section. Um, I can take a look at those as we go on and, and we'll, we'll definitely also reserve time on the back half for questions from the audience to the extent that um, people have them. Um, Kerry, you use the phrase trade-offs a bunch, and of course there's, you know, there's no such thing as a free lunch. And, and, um, and so I, I wondered if you could kind of uh, drill down a little bit deeper about how the toolkit tries to examine or, or illuminate um, what trade-offs there are, um, you know, as you, um, as you recalibrate um, some of the different variables we're talking about here, and um, and I I also want to ask you as a is a kind of adjacent question is um, to to uh, to <laughs> to use another kind of common you know cliche can you ever have your cake and eat it too I mean are the are these are these inherently trade offs is that one of the lessons of the toolkit or does the toolkit partly um, suggests that, that, you know, things might be congruent, that is, uh, you know, um, the, in various ways, you know, can, can you bring cost of electricity down and tamp down carbon emissions, that kind of thing. So maybe you could anyway, tell us a little bit about how this works and what some of the trade-offs are that are, that are involved. Uh, right, so the tool addresses some trade-offs, not everything, but some of them, and I'll, I'll go over these now. Um, so I'll, I guess I'll speak for another 15 or 20 minutes here, just kind of going over some details of how to understand what the tool does and then uh, facilitate questions afterwards. So first of all, you can just access the tool via our website, uh, looking at our policy studies and then energy infrastructure of the future. And there are links to the dashboard. There's also a energy.utexas slash calculators, which has the three calculators that we have for sort of educational uh, purposes and understanding trade-offs of energy. Well, once you click on the dashboard, you end up with um, this, this website here. So this is the interactive website. I'll just go through quickly how it's used here in one or two minutes and then show insights that if you were to run the tool many times like we're doing, uh, what kind of insights we might get. So you can select a region of the country. I'm going to go through Texas as an example region, but there's 13 regions. User selects that. On the left side of the tool, the user selects uh, and I'm just going to give myself the ability to, no, maybe not. Um, the user can select uh, the mix of electricity on the left. So from the major um, technologies, the percentage of electricity for the year 2050 from these technologies. Second thing the user selects is in the middle on the left is the percentage of light duty vehicles that are driven on electricity versus say liquid fuels of petroleum and biofuels. And then the third thing a user selects 
is the percentage of household heating from natural gas or electricity, which is via heat pumps. Uh, and then there's other types of electricity or heat that are such as biomass and uh, petroleum or fuel oil that exist in some regions of the country, and those are approximated as well. Um, the top part of the center column gives uh, information about costs uh, in terms of cents per kilowatt hour and cost per customer per year. That's what I'm going to highlight here as we go forward. Uh, the middle part of the column has summaries about the total generation that was assumed for the um, scenarios, the total amount of power plant capacity of all types that are added up. Um, how much of that, or in addition, how much is from electricity storage in one of the examples. So we have two answers here that come up when you calculate the tool. I'm going to highlight what those two answers tell you later. And then there's land use as a trade-off uh, as well. How much land would it take um, for these sets of power plants, which is mostly about wind and solar. On the bottom right are a series of time series charts. Um, there's some that we call the dispatch. So this is an approximation of the hourly uh, dispatch of electricity from different technologies. And you can zoom in on all these charts and you can turn um, turn the, the legends on and off if you just want to look at one of the technologies. For example, here's wind. So this is the hourly generation of wind for representative weeks in the spring, summer, fall, and winter, just to give a feel for that. So this is done for every region. There's three charts that show differences in costs or the costs associated with the scenario. And important here is that the cost here and the CO2 shown is for the entire energy system of that region. So it's not only about electricity, it's the approximate spending on petroleum and natural gas for commercial residential purposes as well. So I'm gonna highlight some costs later. And of course there's carbon dioxide, which I'll highlight in a second. And again, time series from the year 2000 to the year 2050. So each of these has historical data on costs, CO2 and installed generation capacity to give the user some context of where they're coming from the last 20 years, what's what's presently uh, been done, and then how their scenario changes that for the future. Um, and so each one of these, again, you can zoom in. So I'm going to go back to the slides and show how um, we can think about this. So, um, so just to highlight, there are two kinds of results that come from the tool when you simulate it. And these two kinds of results are meant to capture some bounding cases. Um, so there's one uh, result that comes from the tool that we are labeled without storage. And this means that there is no storage of wind or solar electricity uh, in any way. And so in other words, what this means is if, if the user selects a high penetration of wind and solar, there are times when you can have more wind and solar generation than the load at that hour. And if this occurs in the user's choices and in the data, then 100% of this excess wind and solar generation is assumed to be curtailed. That is to say, not put onto the electric grid. So that's this without storage uh, case result. Then there's also the with storage um, case, which is in some sense attempting to be the exact opposite. In this case, there's no curtailment of wind and solar. So any hour that has more wind and solar generation than load at that hour, all of that gets stored and assumed in a battery. For us, we just assume it as a generic characteristic of the lithium ion battery and costs. So and if any hour has wind and solar greater than load, 100% of this excess wind and solar generation is stored and uh, in a battery and it's discharged at some later hour, sometime in the year um, that has lower net load or has low wind and solar generation. So it's not a diurnal, it's not a daily charge and discharging. It's really thinking about the entire um, the entire year of, of fluctuations of load and demand. And in reality, something will happen in between. So neither of these are really what will happen. We won't have zero storage and we won't be sto probably storing electricity in this way, um, maybe ever, certainly for a long time. Something will be in between. But this is a, our attempting bounding cases on, on what might happen. So I'm gonna summarize three metrics that are displayed on the tool, um, the cost of electricity, land use, and uh, carbon dioxide emissions. Um, first is the cost, and this is per residential customer per year. So this is like a cost of service, what a, somebody on their electric bill might be expected to pay. And I'm going to show a series of these charts here. And so I'm going to spend just a few minutes explaining what this chart is showing you uh, so that we can easily interpret them going forward. So uh, the first thing that this kind of chart will show is that the colors represent electricity generation technologies uh, represented in the scenario that is run by the user. So if you select 
some percentage generation from wind and solar and natural gas, 50%, 40%, 20%. Um, this represents the representation of that scenario. And so the generation mix is from zero to 100% on the left uh, axis. So wind is purple, solar is yellow in this case, natural gas, blue, coal, uh, gray, and nuclear uh, red. Since we don't have a lot of hydropower in, the US, in Texas, then that doesn't uh, show up here, but it could show up in other, other cases. And so what this chart is really showing is showing thousands of individual simulations of the website. So if you push submit on the website, you get one of these little slivers of answers. But we've done this thousands of times and we've piled it here in one figure to investigate the trends that are uh, apparent from our tool. So each sliver represents one electricity generation input mix scenario from the user. So for example, this green one would roughly represent uh, a 50% wind scenario, 37% solar, uh, because there's some gas at the bottom, right? So something like 8% generation from gas, 3% from coal, and 2% from nuclear. And so there's a whole range of scenarios that we've ordered here. And so how have we ordered them here to make sense of them? Uh, and again, I'll thank Danny, uh, Daniel Greer, who's a student working on this uh, for coming up with this clever figure. So there's thousands of scenarios. In this case, they're ordered from the highest cost on the left, uh, to the lowest cost on the right. So that's the rationale for why they're ordered the way they are. And that ordering is represented by the black line that's going from upper left to lower right on the chart. Can um, you talk for a second, Kerry? You can ask a question, go ahead. Yeah. Well, so does this mean that if you, if you cut down your amount of natural gas, coal and nuclear power essentially and replace it with solar, you're looking at more expensive uh, costs to the customer? Uh, so this is, I'm going to go over that, but this is for the case that's labeled at the top. This is with storage. So this is assuming you store every bit of excess wind and solar, which means you're paying for those batteries. And our assumption of cost for the batteries is making the cost go up. So yeah, I'll highlight that in a second. Um, but the order, so the ordering here of the cost, and this is cost per customer per year. And I'll give a context for that here in a second. Um, so every time I'll show a series of these, it'll be this, this same type of chart for land use, the same type of chart for CO2 and we'll compare the three metrics at the end for the trade-off. Um, so just as Asher was kind of asking, okay, what does this mean for the cost? Okay, so there's the scenario on the right, which is assuming you store all excess wind and solar. There's a scenario on the left, which assumes you store none of it. And uh, you can calculate the cost per customer. So they're both the same rationale, but they're two, the two different results you get from the model. And so the first thing to compare them here these are the same height, just so we can kind of see the detail, but we can squash the one on the left so that, for example, the $40,000 a customer per year is the same height on the, on the screen, uh, on the Y or the vertical direction as the um, height, uh, as the one on the right. So here, the black lines are comparable, right? If I draw a horizontal line across here, the cost of the black lines is exactly the same. So let's highlight what Asher was sort of asking in his, in his question. So the historical range of spending on um, electricity for a household, say in Texas, is something like a thousand to $2,000 a year. Uh, so this is the historical kind of amount of money we're spending. So these black lines clearly go above that. And the tool is there to let the user input what they want. It's not telling you what the lowest cost thing is based upon your goals. It's just telling you, letting you select what you want and then it's calculating an answer. And in that sense, it's educational and a person has to interpret the answer. So what about these really high cost scenarios when you have the without storage results? So these high costs are driven by really high penetrations of wind and solar in Texas. And they're essentially driven by increasingly large installed capacity. So you gotta install so many solar panels uh, to reach this you know, attempted say 50% wind and 50% solar type of scenario. Uh, that you've just installed so many solar panels to do this, you, uh, you're getting less and less incremental uh, benefit, and there's just a tremendous amount of capital cost. Uh, on the right side, you don't have to install nearly as many uh, power plants, and I'll highlight this in, in a later slide, uh, but you're substituting this for storage. And our assumed cost for storage here, just to, so I can be clear for this webinar, uh, we took from uh, from, from some analysis at the National Renewable Energy Lab. And most of the data behind this tool are informed by the US government data, some of it from the National Renewable Energy Lab and some of it from the Energy Information Administration. But in 2020, for example, the cost of storage is 
$300 a kilowatt hour of storage capacity and declining to 126 in 2050. Now, if you talk to somebody from Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, they're gonna tell you this is way high than what's already being done. And they might say the current cost is something like half of that. So if you were to divide the cost of storage in half, then the, then the cost could certainly decline to this, but it's still probably not below uh, $10,000 a customer for these sort of most expensive scenarios on the left or the high wind and solar penetration scenarios on the left. So just to give a perspective of, of this, I'm gonna compare these at the end. If we kind of take a scenario A, that's 50% wind and 50% solar and you store none of it, um, then this is almost $45,000 a customer per year. So not, not gonna happen. That's not gonna to be a scenario that comes into fruition, but the tool just to facilitate discussion, again, the tool doesn't presume that uh, you can't calculate that result. So it just tells you that that result is possible. Um, but on the other hand, if you think, okay, if you relax that a bit and you say, well, I'm just going to have 40% of each and 20% from natural gas, uh, you end up in a, uh, a, a range of costs in the scenario B that is comparable to what we're paying today. So this is an example of why someone might say you can get to high penetrations of renewables without investing in storage too much or other types of things on the grid, and you can still have reasonable costs and high decarbonization that we'll look at. In, in a second. So the second one I'm looking at here is land, second out of three metrics, and this is direct land use. So this is what we would call the sort of actual footprint of wind and solar farms on the ground. So it's the pads or the clearing of the, of the land where the wind turbine is actually resting or the solar panels actually covering the land, including substations, for example. This does not include, for example, space between wind turbines that you can farm in between, things like this. So this is only this direct land use. And so just as before, on the right, we've got some results. Here, they're not ordered from lowest to least, most cost on the left to the least cost on the right. They're ordered from the most land use on the left, to the least land use on the right. And this is a million acres on the right, uh, hand axis. And we have the without storage results as well. So we have the same ordering from most land on the left to least land on the right. And just like before, we, the Y axis of the land use shown here is not the same. So if you have storage, if you wanna make the black lines on the same scale for both cases, uh, you basically have to shrink down the with storage results uh, to where they almost are negligible compared to the scenario on the right. And that's because the highest land use, if you're gonna store all the excess wind and solar was about 1 million uh, acres. And so if I squash 1 million acres to compare it to the chart on the left, um, it looks quite small because it goes up to say 80 million acres. And so again, the same thing why there was high cost for this without storage uh, result uh, is that gets calculated is because you've installed so many wind and solar farms, uh, mostly due to solar. Um, so this is driven by the, the desire of the tool just saying I'm going to meet the hourly capacity, uh, hourly demand at all hours of the year. And for example, our little scenario A that's 50% wind and 50% solar is 81 million acres. It's 48% the land of Texas. Uh, so again, sorry, is that going to happen? No, that's that's not going to happen. That's just a pretty extreme case. But again, the tool just allows you to calculate that so that you can communicate this information uh, about the need for other technologies. And so the what this means is if you look at how much capacity actually gets installed, what I'm showing here on the on the right is a chart that is on the website. So this is one of the time series charts that you can look at on the website. And it's basically saying, okay, this is 17 million megawatts of capacity, mostly solar uh, panels uh, getting installed. Okay, so that's a, a very large number. If you look at our little scenario B, where we relax this a little bit and say, well, what if I'm okay with 20% gas and 80% renewables, then I'm half a million acres and, uh, or sorry, I'm still, um, um, half a million megawatts. So right now in Texas, there's maybe 150, or let's just say 0.15 million megawatts or 150,000 uh, megawatts. And this is, you know, this is something like three, two to three times that number. So not out, totally outlandish um, and the lower um, land use and, and, and comparable costs from earlier. So that's just the example of land use. Uh, so now we've looked at cost and land use. And now what about carbon dioxide emissions? And what I'm showing you here is carbon dioxide emissions cumulative from 2020 to 2050, because the tool goes to 2050. 
So we have the same scenarios, the right and the left scenario, uh, the with storage and without storage. And we've got to now I've squashed it down again to make the black lines that are indicating the carbon emissions over 30 years comparable on scale, the, the correct. Uh, Can I for a second, Karen? Yeah. yeah. Why, as obvious as it is to you, why should it be any different with and without storage uh, uh, for the carbon emissions? Uh, well, ask me that again after I click this button a few more times and see if I, see if I answer your question. So, um, so in this case, on the right, if you have storage, essentially if you have over 65% wind, solar, and nuclear, low carbon, zero carbon during operations, uh, you've, you've pretty much decreased the emissions from the electricity sector about as much as you can do. It still goes down from this point I've indicated here by this vertical black line, still decreases, but you're near this, say, 20,000 uh, million tons of carbon dioxide over the course of 30 years. At Texas right now is about 700 uh, tons of uh, uh, million, to or yeah, 700 million tons of carbon dioxide a year. So kind of multiply that times 30, you get pretty much this number. Um, so that's the explanation of the, of the storage on the right. Uh, and the storage, in the case on the left, this without storage results kind of has two uh, explanations. If you look at the cheapest, or not the cheapest, sorry, but the lowest cost or the lowest CO2 emissions over the 30 year horizon, this one's driven by really high wind scenarios, right? Wind is going over 70%. It just because the black, the purple section on that uh, graph is, is relatively high. And it shows, okay, if you have that much, then you fill this in with say 20% more solar PV. And then with just a little bit of natural gas, coal or nuclear, or some other thermal generation, you pretty much decarbonize the grid as about as much as you can do. Um, again, assuming there's no storage here, right? Um, the, the tool doesn't allow you to calculate an answer that's infeasible in terms of just timing the generation output. So you'll notice that solar doesn't go to near 75 or 80% here on any of these charts on the left, and that's because you just can't actually physically do it without storage. Um, the left side has a little bit different explanation. So the left side scenarios that are really high carbon here um, have a different sort of set of scenarios. And these are high penetration solars that are over 40% solar generation. And they're mixed with mostly most wind power, but can be mixed with some other things as well. Um, and so these are, again, driven by large installations of solar to meet this user desired scenario of say over 40% solar. And why would you get high carbon emissions from installing a bunch of solar? Well, the answer is because there's emissions associated with building and installing capacity of power plants in general, and you have to build so many solar farms that it's you know concrete, steel, and making silicon, and you know the, the energy consumed uh, and the CO2 emissions from making concrete and steel that effectively embody the emissions in the solar farm. So that's ex example here again. If we have our 50% wind and 50% solar scenario, which is the letter A here again on the on the chart, um, the orange section on the right here basically is the emissions embodied from uh, power plant manufacturing and construction. So the other three colors are direct emissions from burning coal, um, natural gas, and petroleum within the economy overall. Uh, you're installing so many solar panels that you have a high embodied carbon dioxide emissions within them. And if you look at our little scenario B, which is a relaxed scenario, 20% gas and 80% wind and solar, then you can see that these power plant manufacturing uh, emissions, embodied emissions are much smaller, uh, largely associated with batteries. Uh, coal goes to zero because we've pretty much taken away all coal uh, generation in Texas. And you have a relatively constant but declining carbon di dioxide emissions for Texas overall. And again, it's because the other ones are associated with the non-electricity sectors. So this is a summary chart of what we just went over and be the end of my slides here. Um, so we looked at land use, which is this uh, first row, millions of acres, looked at cumulative CO2 over 30 years, which is the second row. And the last row is the cost of service, which is a real dollar cost of service per customer per year. And if you look at, you know, sort of metrics that are not, uh, that, that are feasible, we can look at each row and say, okay, uh, something like, one million acres or less, that's 
you know, that's, that's less than 1% or it's 1% or less of all the land in Texas. Maybe something like that is feasible for a wind and solar farm installation. Uh, for the cumulative CO2, the, the, the three scenarios on the right uh, with storage and the, on, the, on the right, and then the, the scenario B without storage, these are all about the same amount of carbon dioxide emissions over a 30 year time horizon. Uh, but the cost of service is the one that kind of sticks out again because of our assumptions of a storage cost and the uh, without storage result with the 20% wind and 80% renewables is a comparable cost to what we're paying today. So this would lend credence to anyone that says, yeah, we can keep installing wind and solar in Texas for a while before we in increase costs significantly. This would be some, some evidence for that. Uh, so this middle view scenario could be, you know, is sort of feasible or tolerable on all three of these metrics. Um, and the, the question on the right ones with storage is just, okay, how much can you get uh, storage costs down? Those could, somebody could argue those, you could divide those by two, but I'm not sure if you can divide them by 10 yet uh, to get to the costs. So I will stop there, Asher, and you can ask other questions and, or, or take them from the audience. Oh, can't hear you, Asher. Sorry, it, it, first of all, it, it's a super impressive uh, uh, product. Uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's something, you know, I encourage people to, to um, you know, to try for themselves. Uh, as you said at the top of it, they can do that through the UT Energy website or uh, what is it, ut.edu slash calculators is the other uh, one? Energy.utexas.edu and then slash calculators. Yeah. Yeah, so I encourage people to play around with it. I mean, that's what it's it's there for. Um, and it's already, you know, obvious. I mean, you you touched on it there at the end how it has its own lessons. You know, depending on what you want to draw, what lessons you want to draw, but it can confirm or or suggest ways you can keep costs down for customers while increasing, you know, wind and, and solar power. I you know I thought that aside you had about you know how much. Um, emissions might continue to go up even if, as you amp up solar power. That's the kind of thing that if you are from some sector of the fossil fuel industry, you'll kind of latch onto that as well. Um, there are a couple of logistical questions that came up with how to use it. Um, the, the questions from YouTube that I would just like you to address before we get to slightly broader um, things. One, one question was, you mentioned there are 13 regions. Um, so this is just a quick question. How are those determined and do they align with the, with the different NERC reliability entities? All right. Um, they don't exactly line up with NERC reliability entities, but we tried to, I guess in doing something like this, and again, in the background, we're really integrating data across the entire energy system, not just electricity. So there's, I guess there's no one breakdown uh, that's the easiest, um, but, in terms of practically running the research project, many data are at a state level. So just aggregating states into groups is became practically the uh, rationale. And then we sort of tried to aggregate those state groups into NERC-like regions as much as possible. So that was really the trade-off. Um, another question uh, that came in through YouTube was, do these cost simulations just look at energy delivered versus energy delivered and energy held for contingency reserve? Uh, right. So there's not an explicit, um, I guess, modeling in the background of operating reserves or, and, and these kinds of things. Um, so right now that's not being uh, incorporated. You could add another, you know, 7% or something like this, to, or 10%. You can you, try to pick your, your guess about how many reserves are, are needed. Um, but right now, that's that's not that's not in there. So you can think about yeah, a little bit higher. In some sense, the you know when you once you get to these sort of really high renewable scenarios, that kind of goes out the wash in terms of understanding that uh, that level of detail. But it is it is important, and we're working on a journal paper, and so that's a good insight that we might in include that uh, for the results of that paper and update the tool. Um, and by the way, again, I want to encourage people to, you can ask questions through YouTube, you can ask in the Q&A or chat section at the, at the part of the Zoom webinar. And there's one other question that we have here, uh, and then I'll, I'll 
I'll throw a bunch more questions your way. Um, has anyone done an energy balance on the generation of wind and solar power, says one attendee. And does this include that um, it does cost energy and CO2 to, to make solar panels and windmills? I mean, I guess you, you addressed that um, in, your, in, in your talk just now, Carrie. but if you wanna touch on that briefly one more time. A little bit, yeah. So I think this person might be asking a little bit more than what I showed. So um, in terms of yeah, how much energy does it cost to make a solar panel or a wind turbine or any other power plant for that matter? So as this person may know, it's one of my favorite topics of sort of net energy or energy return on investment. I put this into context in my book. Um, but we didn't explicitly do that for energy as part of this tool, but we explicitly took into account those types of studies for the CO2 embodied. And as the question implies, uh, carbon, some of the carbon dioxide associated with building and installing power plants is because of the burning of fossil fuels during that process, driving a truck or something like this. Uh, so that's in there, but not the energy balance. And, right. So I have a few, few things I wanted to, to ask you. Um, one was just putting this all together. Um, was there anything, and then running these different, you know, simulations over and over again, was there anything that surprised you or did it essentially confirm, you know, you have compared to the average person, a vast knowledge about, about these systems. Um, did it, did it confirm what you already essentially knew? I confirmed some things that uh, people studying this, I think tend to, say they know or we have high confidence in, which is you can probably get, depending on the region you're in, you can probably get to 70 or 80% wind and solar without changing much on the grid in terms of the overall cost um, and the maybe, may, maybe or maybe not the reserve requirements. You have a lot more capacity standing by, say for natural gas. So this kind of confirms that, at least for this Texas example, um, which is kind of extreme in the sense that there's no hydropower sort of uh, be part of the renewables mix as opposed to the Northwest United States, which would have higher um, <clears throat> hydropower able to contribute to a low carbon mix. Uh, so that is kind of confirmed. The cost side, you know, I didn't exactly know how high the cost would go given the sort of assumptions we put in. So that's probably higher than I, I might have anticipated. Um, but it gives people, so I, I don't interpret it, them as saying, hey, this is why you can't do this. You would interpret it as saying, well, given our cost assumptions now, this would probably be infeasible. You know, this is looking 30 years. Um, you know, how's it gonna, how can we change it? You know, there's several assumptions behind the tool that I guess it's easy for me to say to interpret the results. And that's a challenge in, in this kind of a tool. But um, I would say it's probably confirmed mostly what I, what I thought. Um, but it's challenging to try to explain multiple metrics um, to people in a way that you, uh, they can think about them themselves um, if they haven't thought about them before. So that's, that's, I hadn't approached that yet. So we're running, running through that challenge now. Perhaps this is an unfair question to ask, but how, how much confidence should we have in these kinds of projections? I mean, you, you touched just a second ago on underlying metrics. Mm -hmm. And I asked this partly, you know, uh, I helped cover politics. And of course we just came through a political season where um, polling turned out to be um, bizarro off the walls, right? With a lot of um, projections. So I know this is a, like a completely different realm, um, but I wondered if you could address that for a minute. And partly what I have in mind here is a kind of thought experiment. Obviously you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be able to, you wouldn't have access to all this data 30 years ago. You, you, it would be hard to assemble it. It would be hard to display it in this beautiful way that, uh, you and others have worked together to, to, to do. Um, but if, if you had tried 30 years ago in 1990 to imagine the energy makeup uh, in Texas or other places, if you had you know, landed on the percentages that they are now, would you get the kind of cost or you know, um, carbon you know, output that you do. In other words, as we ch change the widgets now, looking at 2050, and it, in these these scenarios, say, okay, well, if you have this percentage of wind and this percentage of solar, et cetera, nu nuclear power, you're going to get these out. These here are some of the trade-offs and outcomes. 
how much confidence can we have that 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 that, that that's what what the lay of the land might look like or the, that's how those are the kinds of costs that we will in fact be associated with the this kind of makeup in 30 years so it's a bit of a garbled question but i think uh, you got right right i guess so um i guess in terms of 1990 uh, aside from me being in high school uh, I, I wouldn't have been able to do this but uh, it would have been hard to have anything reasonable to say i think about the costs of say including a mix of uh, wind and solar power and uh, batteries um, would have been able to have now. I, I, I can't imagine having a very accurate assessment of that in terms of the mix. Um, in terms of the accuracy of this model, it's it's probably a little bit better than say an order of magnitude check, uh, like is the number one, is the number 10, or is it 100 or 1,000, and just you know getting the right order of magnitude. It's, it's probably a little bit better than that, but it's not accurate to say understand you know the difference between 10 million tons of carbon dioxide a year or even over 30 years or you know the cost of ten dollars difference on someone's bill maybe starting to get to the cost of accurate within the cost of a few hundred dollars uh, a year for a person's bill in, in you know future year 2050 uh, something like that. Um, that, that that's really important to a question to ask for something like this, and it's not obvious because the numbers just get displayed. Uh, they get displayed, and we try to display them without, I guess, accuracy that we don't claim to understand, but we can probably improve that. Uh, people can suggest improvements, certainly. Um, but yeah, anybody's projection is, it's hard to interpret for a, a lay person uh, or even experts uh, when they look at someone's, you know, if you read a report and it has some projections out for 2050, and of course we're talking or Biden's talking about going to zero carbon for the electric grid by 2035. So this doesn't push it to 2035. So that's even faster. So um, so in this sense, this is a relaxed version of what Biden is talking about. Um, the goal is to put this, the quote, the core code uh, open source in the spring as we finalize the, the, the sort of journal paper and full documentation. So hopefully for any energy nerds out there, they can run it themselves um, at a more refined detail. But yeah, understanding the assumptions of anyone's projection in terms of certainly for um, economic growth, uh, this is what I touch on in my book about the assumptions that are made behind economic growth models. So I do touch on that a lot more in my book, which is, I guess, longer. I, I, I want to ask it. you about your book. I'm glad you mentioned that too, because the book, uh, The Economic Superorganism, which I had the pleasure last uh, in the fall of last year when I was at the Energy Institute, I had the pleasure of reading bits of in pieces yeah, of Carrie's pleasure of being a guinea pig for me. Yes. A book. Yeah, well it was it was a, it was great. Um, and it's called again it's called the economic superorganism. It's available at wherever you like to get your books and it makes a great uh, stocking stuffer. Um, um, but you know it seems to me, you know, the, the the book asks important questions about the competing narratives we tell each other about the relationship of energy and economics. Um, and I want to I want to ask you one question about that, and then I, uh, I'm going to go back to the kind of uh, audience submitted questions here. But in the book, you write about techno optimism and techno realism, and in some ways, these idea these concepts form what I think are like the intellectually minded questions that are lurking behind a practical tool like this one that you're you're that we're talking about today. So in that sense, these things dovetail. Um, so these terms, techno-realism seems to mean that uh, no matter what kind of energy we use, we're gonna have some kinds of uneven social impacts, right? Haves and have nots globally uh, in terms of pollution and other things. And, and uh, techno-optimism kind of means, my read on that is that we can innovate our way out of energy problems. I wondered if you could just uh, talk for a moment about these two ideas, techno-optimism and techno-realism, and, um, and, and if it's right to think about these kinds of questions being in the background behind a, a, a toolkit like this one. Right. Uh, a tool like the Energy Futures Dashboard probably has a minimal number of assumptions about techno-optimism, you know, the economic growth. There is an assumption there. We put costs as a comparison to GDP, uh, but we just said, okay, I just assume GDP grows at 2% a year for uh, no reason other than that's the pattern for the last 10 years or so um, going forward. Uh, so there's 
that assumption in there, that's just something that has to be made if I want to express, if we want to express costs as a function of fraction of GDP, which I think is important for understanding feedbacks of the energy system in general. So that's pretty uh, ballparky. But yeah, so techno realism I see as, in some sense, people paying attention to the physical nature of the world and the economy and the constraints that that imposes, both in terms of time, like the time it takes to build stuff. Uh, if I want to build a million, uh, whatever, a million megawatts of solar panels, and I want to install them in one year, that's totally different than if I want to install the same number of 10 years. It's literally time. It's really the, the rate of change of things is what actually matters. And a lot of um, the, you know, the, the book has these two axes, energy and economic narratives. So energy narratives are fossil energy and renewable energy is these sort of caricature cases. And there's plenty of caricature quotes uh, that one can choose from that I put in the book to demonstrate people with those. But it's but to understand why someone chooses a fossil energy narrative, that's why I got into the economic narratives. And for the most part, I think most things we read are in the techno optimism narrative combined with either fossils or renewables, right? My technology is gonna advance and it's gonna do what I need it to do uh, to, to assess carbon emissions or societal ills to some degree. Um, and uh, the book focus, I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards the techno realism uh, for sure. And it's because I think that certain social trends have already and economic trends have been affected by constraints on energy resources and that economists in general don't focus on that largely because the normal economic training doesn't include sort of the incorporation of physical principles of energy and how you do, how you think about what the economy is and how it operates. So that's my research program. But uh, so I, I found it basically crucial to say, uh, if you think about the earth as a finite planet and think about the uh, correct timing as well as debt, how do, you, how do you interpret the differences between money and physical flows of things like energy? Uh, how do you actually conceptually uh, think about that? And for the people that do, I think we, and the, the research that exists out there, I think they have much realistic, uh, much better explanations of say, long-term trends in the economy uh, for the last 60 or 70 years, particularly in the US. Uh, my, my favorite example is, uh, you know, wage inequality increasing in the 19th, 70s, and that's exactly when uh, we had a change in energy paradigm with the oil crises and energy consumption per person stopped increasing. So that seems too uh, coincidental to me not to be related. And uh, I, I focus on that in the book a little bit as well. Well, I I really liked reading it, and uh, it was a beautiful synthesis of a lot of things and brought a lot of learning. Uh, and I again, it's called the economic superorganism. If you're on this webinar, you're obviously interested in these kinds of questions. And in a way, Carrie's book goes beyond the bounds of this dashboard. It's about all the rippling effects and all the policy discussions and pol political discussions that go into these kind of competing, often, uh, you know, head kind of budding questions about, about where we're going to get our energy from. Um, so I want to go uh, take a look here at some other questions have come in. Um, I'm just going to go down. There's um, uh, somebody asked, uh, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. I think you already mentioned this, but just to confirm, the storage type is battery. Is that correct? Um, yeah, yeah. So we just kind of assume a you said lithium ion battery, right? A, a lithium ion battery just for the sake of uh, assuming something. But the characteristics are pretty generic. Um, but one thing that's useful, I'm just going to show here. I have an example of a, um, let's just say this 40% wind and solar and 20% um, scenario. Um, I don't know. Are, are you seeing the, well, maybe not seeing the screen yet? Let's go. Yeah, there you go. Um, so it quantifies the storage capacity. So this is actually uh, a useful thing in itself, independent of the cost assumption. We just have a round trip efficiency assumption, like, uh, you know, there's 85% of efficiency of storing and discharging the energy, for example. And in this particular case, it says, okay, there's 105,000 megawatts of power capacity in storage, and there's 67 terawatt hours of energy storage capacity. And in this case of this simulation, the Texas total net generation uh, that goes onto the grid 
is about 630 terawatt hours. So this is saying like something like 10% of annual storage of annual generation, uh, which is roughly consumption, uh, would need to be stored. And that's not so that's a useful metric in itself, just to say like it's really not going to be much larger than that. Uh, that's kind of a high end uh, number. And when you think about other system, energy systems in North America or the US that store energy, the natural gas distribution network is a great example. Um, we have to store natural gas or we do store natural gas to, to mitigate between fluctuation of demand between the winter, which is a high natural gas demand for heating and the spring and the fall, which is lower because there's not as much electricity generation or heating. And we store about 30% of the annual consumption of natural gas in caverns. And we don't talk about the cost of that storage and that storage very much because it's relatively cheap. So uh, the electricity system, in terms of the analysis using this tool, doesn't seem to be that much different. You can have high wind and solar penetrations and, and stay below 30% annual storage to meet every single hour. So, so that might be a general, um, Interesting. general trend. We also we're gonna we're gonna go slightly lightning round here because um, we're we're. Just go. I'll try to go shorter on the answer. Go. Yeah, no, that's fine. The the other question this person asked, which I think is an interesting one, is when the, is the analysis only about sort of specific regions? Could could you take uh, you know in the without storage scenario? scenario could you take you curtail? Could en curtailed energy be sold to the other electricity regions? Is that something contemplated by the? Right. Um, so one trade off on the tool to get it to calculate. Uh, relatively quickly is the, the simplistic assumptions about how regions would be connected. Um, the only assumption made about how regions would be connected is that well, wind farms and concentrating solar power could be in neighboring regions and imported into another region. So we have, I have a, we made a standard sort of ballpark set of assumptions, say for California, if they wanted wind power, uh, only 10% of the wind would actually be in California boundary and 50% might be in the mountain north region, which would be, you know, places like Wyoming and maybe the other 40% in the northwest region. So we sort of inherently made some of these assumptions. Uh, in reality, we don't know what the answer is, but we know that the power is going to cross these regional boundaries. And so we've made uh, some reasonable assumptions for that, but it's fixed. Um, so that's, and we count for transmission connection. Uh, that would be associated with connecting those as well. And we inherently calculate the number of miles of transmission, but it's not being displayed on the tool. So that's a good question. And that's really one of the unknowns. Hopefully this tool can at least just start the discussion and facilitate the discussion of what's required. Yeah, and I think that's a good answer too. That also actually addresses a couple of the other questions that um, people wrote in here. So um, somebody wrote, this is a, like a, you talked about how you have a, little hobby thinking about how much it costs to actually build plants and stuff. How long, how long does it generally take to pay for a wind generator? And what is the life of it, of a generator? You have quick. Uh, well, I think uh, wind turbine, I mean, most of the analyses assume something in the order of 25 years um, during that time, maybe there's an upgrade on the, uh, the, the electronics, the power electronics, maybe not, maybe the generator itself. So I think that's, generally lifetime. What does it take to pay for energy-wise in terms of the previous question? Most of the analyses come up with, you know, well, less than two years and maybe even less than one year in terms of energy. That can get tricky on how you define your little system boundary. So you can email me on longer questions on that. I know papers that treat the whole economy as essentially, yeah, a super organism that extracts energy to maintain itself. And so in that sense, you, you can't really draw a boundary around one part of it. Um, but the paying for money that, uh, I think somebody else can probably answer that better than, better than myself. It's probably just a, with a tax credit, you know, sure. probably just a few, a few years, uh, it's going to get harder and harder to pay for them if, just because the, they're driving the I mean, I think, down. I think right? a good point, by the way, that's a whole other tool. You could have a tool where you, you factor in tax credits as, as part of the, as part yeah, you can sort of, if you know that, what the tax it, credits. That's do, a big variable. Yeah, if you know what the tax credits do, then you can sort of play around with our levelized cost of electricity calculator and and augment the inputs in terms of uh, capital costs or uh, operating costs to try to, <laughs> to tr try to get a general idea. Um, somebody asks, is this is this solely the energy cost considered for the residential customer, or is the transmission and distribution cost included as yes. well? Yeah, so it is. Does it does include transmission and distribution costs. And some of those costs are particular for regions based upon previous work we did 
analyzing FERC data from their form one, which regulated utilities submit their, their spending and operational, operational cost data annually. So we've used that and sort of calibrated transmission and distribution costs. So they are included in the sense that a residential customer is inherently paying uh, for the transmission and distribution grid in their, in their bill as well. Um, just to, uh, you know, it occurs to me that this is, we're having this, this, uh, this conversation in the interregnum between the Trump administration and the Biden administration, supposedly. I mean, I, apparently it's, it's still in doubt here uh, um, in some quarters, but, you know, this seems like, to me as a Texas energy reporter, it seems like an interesting time also about the sort of Texas uh, electricity model, you know, here is a kind of model potentially for the for the for the rest of the country i know that 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 goes beyond in a way the frame of this this uh this dashboard but i didn't know if you wanted to take a second to talk about um you know washington and and the raft of energy issues that that they're in electricity issues that they're thinking about i mean you the green new deal in a way is like one of those scenarios right that that you're putting into the thing. That's one way of thinking about it. And it, that may be the scenario where it's going to turn out to be prohibitively cost, unfeasible, and so on. Um, so yeah, don't let me forget to come to the Green New Deal on cost, at least one comment. So I, I just on the, since I'm still sharing, I just clicked off all of the costs spending on energy system except transmission and distribution operating and capital costs, just to show the person asking the question that you can sort of uh, separate those out. Um, but yeah, what's the takeaway from Texas? I guess, you know, I don't know how many people, have, but it, there is discussion of, you know, sort of the Texas model of how the energy system operates here and how transferable that is. I'm, I'm sort of skeptical on how transferable it is. And one of the reasons is because Texas is literally pretty big. Um, it's got a lot of areas of sun, got a lot of areas of wind, it's got a lot of areas of coal and natural gas comes out and even coal. So, I mean, and we even mine uranium in Texas. So it's, it sort of has all the energy resources and you don't have to cross political boundaries, at least a state political boundary to say transfer electricity and ERCOT is somewhat set up so that there is no, no transfer of electricity within that market to other states. It does happen, but it, they keep it regulatory the same uh, in terms of not having federal uh, regulations. So that's not really transferable to any of the other states. Uh, they don't all have the same quantity of resources within their own state boundaries. So they have to work across state lines to do things. And that's when it gets complicated. I mean, if we just drew a line down the middle of Texas and we had West Texas as a state, and East or Central Texas, you know, would we have had the competitive renewable energy zone transmission lines that connected, you know, that was a statewide you know, policy decision made to facilitate um, uh, wind development in this case. Um, uh, would it have happened? It, it could have still happened for sure. Would it have been as easy? I, I, I don't know. Well, um, I mean, I think that's a good point. In fact, one of my predecessors is a, is a journalism fellow at the Energy Institute, Russell Gold, his latest book, he's a Wall Street Journal reporter, is about yeah. the political problems of getting a kind of transmission mandate. Right. So his book, so that book is essentially, you know, uh, point number one for trying to build transmission lines across state boundaries to connect wind, right? It didn't have to happen in Texas. You, if you go out of Texas, you got to cross state boundaries. So that's something. I mean, Texas in general, we, we did a, a, a report comparing California and Texas uh, financial support or subsidies. And uh, it, my conclusion from that was, aside from I don't really like studying subsidies that much, is that, you know, Texas just seems to have policies that are about doing stuff. If you want to build this thing, uh, here, we'll help you build it. Is it a wind turbine? Sure. Okay, here's a wind turbine. Go go, go build it. You want to drill? Okay, sure. Go drill. But just just do something. Uh, <laughs> this seems to be the, the Texas policy. Um, I think that that's, if I'm not mistaken, I think we're, we've sort of run out of time here. Yeah, right? I think we're kind of here. So, you know. what, I, what I want, what I think we ought to do to, to wrap things up here is let people know again how they can, um, how they can, Look at the look at the at the energy futures dashboard um, because I just you know it's it's really a useful thing um, and uh, and I highly recommend it to the people on this on this on this webinar. Uh, thank yeah thanks Asher. Anybody I mean you can certainly critique it and add insights. Uh, we're working on we have documentation about how it works. Um, the energy futures 
dashboard documentation. So we've got the nuts and bolts behind it. Uh, it's not exciting reading, but for anybody who's, who's willing, you can do that. Uh, but just insights into the tool, presenting information, how to phrase things, better ways to present it. Uh, we can try to take these things into account. Um, but yeah, we can go ahead. So I, th I, I think we answered just about all the questions that came through. Is there anything else we failed to address that you want to um, that you want to address now, Kerry? Uh, no. Oh, I, th I think I forgot to mention it's, uh, again the Green New Deal question you had. I yeah. think one of the big questions there, aside from just how much money it costs to sort of build out infrastructure, is is really when it comes down to who pays for it, right? If it's private developers spending money and taking out loans, or if it's the federal government, that these are two fundamentally different ways of quote unquote paying for something. And so the cost implications are completely different. Uh, none of that is, you know, discussed in the tool. You could use the tool to sort of talk about the numbers, uh, but then you, have, you need something else to talk about if the money comes from the federal government or from uh, private loans and debt. So that, so hopefully this can facilitate discussions like Green New Deal and these kinds of things, but it's certainly not the end all answer. Uh, well, thanks. Thanks a lot for uh, for for working on this project. Thanks to the to the other people who worked with you on this project. It's it's a it's a really impressive calculator. Um, yeah, I should have should have mentioned them. So Josh Rhodes uh, is heavily influential. He's still at UT. Gershon Gulen is no longer at UT. Heavily influential, and of course Daniel Greer is working with me again, a student who is really brilliant. So uh, there was half a dozen other people as well, other students. So thank you. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody for participating.